So my name is Evan Light, and I'm going to give you a iOS I for you, well, Ruby web guys, instead of Rails guys, which is what I called it. Um, basically, I want to show some of you guys, or show you why iOS is not as intimidating to develop for as you might imagine. Um, and even though it's kind of evil to the goodness that is Ruby, because it's a walled garden, whereas Ruby, almost everything's MIT licensed, it's still actually a kind of fun place to play. Um, just to give you a little bit of background before, before I really get into it, uh, I started out as a C programmer, did way too much Java, found Ruby, got very happy, then started doing Ruby for a living, and realized I needed a slightly different hobby. Then the iPad came out, and I got really excited. I didn't care about the iPhone so much. But um, iOS just seemed kind of hard for a while. And then I had a few people point me in the right direction, found a whole bunch of good resources, and was able to make sense of it. And I'm here to try to share some of that with you and show you guys why it's not such a scary, but it is actually a fun place to be. So for starters, let's talk about the language a little bit that you use to develop for I with iOS. This is Objective-C, which is a small talk, or a C with small talk extensions, essentially. So to some extent, that, that gives it a little bit of um, a Ruby flavor. This might look a little bit funny. Yes, you've got, uh, if the, the, at the top you have a functionate declaration, a method declaration, uh, which you have to do in C. It's something you don't have to deal with in Ruby. And at the bottom, we have an invocation of that method. So just talking about the method declaration in the top first, you might notice that it looks a little bit funny that I have these, these names on the left with a colon, and then I have a type declaration and a variable name. The names on the left, all of those put together essentially give you the method name. So one of the most beautiful things about Objective-C that you can do that you actually have to fake in Ruby is that you can write really literate code. You can write code that reads like English. So when I invoke this method, which is what I'm doing at the bottom, I'm sending it to myself. You still have self in Objective-C like you have in Ruby. And it's you perform asynchronous get to URL with headers on success, do something, on fail, do something. Um, and just to go into a little bit more detail, because you're going to see some of this off and on throughout the presentation, the, um, you, you have to have an at sign in front of your quotes, or else bad things happen, like your app crashes. This is how you tell Objective-C, I'm declaring a, sting, a string statically in my code. So that's one of the weird things you just have to get used to. Just like when you first, flashback to when you started learning Ruby, you had to, to learn that at signs meant member variables, double at signs meant class variables, and you might not think it now, but back then, that probably looked pretty weird to you. I know it turned me off at first. So I'm just going to introduce you to a few of the language peccadilloes you just need to accept and then get past. So that's one of them. You got the at with the quotes. Um, on success and on fail, those are actually passing function pointers. They call them selectors in um, Objective-C, where it's very much like in JavaScript. We're handing a callback off. Um, functions aren't exactly first class objects, the selector says, give me a handle to this so that way I can pass something else. So anyway, that's Objective-C. I think it's a pretty beautiful language, um, or at least that, that's in a very nutshell. And you can write some really nice code in it. So moving right along though, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, the Rails golden path. This is just a screenshot of the canonical blog application where you create blog posts, you can read up blog posts, you can update blog posts and delete them. So here's the iPhone golden path. An iPhone golden, the iPhone golden path, or really the iOS golden path, is a table-based application. And when I say table-based, this here is really a single table. Um, at the top here and here are just section, section header names. And then each one of these is just a cell, and a cell can, you can, compose a template for a cell, much like you have templates in Rails or any other framework you're using for the most part for web development. And you've got an image, you've got text, and okay, so we've got a little icon here with some information. Um, the iPad golden path is, again, they, the table is present as well, but they have this thing called the split view controller, which you'll see a lot of if you own an iPad, you buy iPad apps, where you have a table on the left side, you can scroll it up and down and whatnot. And then clicking somewhere in the table might modify the table, or it might modify this detail view over here on the right. 
and that detail view can be yeah, pretty much whatever you want. In that case, it's another table with also a section of headers just formatted a little bit differently. And that's pretty much the golden path. In addition to that, you have um, some database backing, which I'll talk more about. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about generators. That's uh, Tony Stark's arc reactor from Iron Man, if anyone remembers. Um, as a newbie to iOS, I had to lean pretty heavily initially on the generated code. And I think it's a fairly reasonable thing to do. A lot of people in Rails poo-poo scaffolding. But for, for new people, it's important. And I was a new iOS developer a little over a month ago. So I really, really needed the scaffolding. Um, and sure, scaffolding are training wheels, but um, they're awfully helpful training wheels. <laughs> so uh, yeah, don't, don't knock them. When you're, when, you're, when you're new at first, those, 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 those training wheels are a big deal. Um, once you, know, you get more experience, okay, maybe you don't need them. But yeah, work with them starting out. So Rails and iOS, um, as platforms go, are both MVC um, in just in different ways. Uh, Rails is very model-based. Now, the reason you see a big censored logo up there is because when I said Rails is obsessed with models, um, I was going to have, imagine, if you will, a picture of a, a, a very hot, scantily clad woman on one side, and for the ladies in the audience, a fairly equally hot but scantily clad male on the other side. Um, I, was, I, I did check this with Mike, and he didn't think it was such a great idea, so you're going to see this off and on throughout the presentation whenever we talk about models. Okay, so. Moving right along, Apple, on the other hand, is somewhat obsessed with the controller instead of with the models. They really seem to want you to do almost everything for your application in the controller. So to someone who's done a, a bit of Rails like me, I, I find that very annoying. I, I was taught skinny controller, fat model. Um, don't imagine that picture. Too late. OK. So, <laughs> but uh, in any event, um, it's just it's something you have to fight with a little bit. The scaff and, and let's talk about that. So with Rails 3 generated code, you, you go run, you know, generate a scaffold for a blog. You get about 100 lines of code total. And almost none of that's in the model, granted. But you don't need that much. And the scaffolding and the controller, well, you, you guys already know most of this. Now, for iPad, if I want to have a database-backed application, I get about 500 lines of Objective-C code. OK, so that's a lot of code. And then in addition to that, I get two what are called XIB files. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Those are XML interface builder files. And we, you don't want to know how big they are. They're huge. You're never going to edit those if you do actually use them. I'm going to tell you you probably shouldn't, and we'll talk more about that later, too. So let's talk about uh, iOS some more. Uh, like Rails, iOS is event-driven, just in a different fashion. Um, with Rails. You could say that Rails is event-driven for when a, when a user or some kind of service comes along and says, I want access to a particular resource. With iOS, you have, a lot of, you have user events, but then you have all kinds of system-level events to deal with also. So um, the first and most important one, at least to me, is load view. That says when the app is loading up, when I'm about to display a view, do whatever's in here. Now, the default. Sca the default generated code, the scaffolding, if you will, does not use that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But then these are just other uh, events, if you will, that occur or can occur. There are a lot of different hooks in iOS. And I'll tell you where to look to find those later, so that way you can get yourself started. These are just a few, some that I use in, in one of the controllers for an, the application I put in the App Store lately. But I just wanted to give you guys a little bit something to look at. So. I can, so I can register to know when the views a, didn't the view just appeared. I can talk about when the view will. I can ask to know when the view is about to appear. That's another one. Um, I, can have, I, I can tell iOS, look, I'm interested in knowing when the screen's going to rotate. Um, that's kind of important. <laughs> um, and then, of course, I can go down more at the system level and say, I, you know, I want to know when there's a memory problem. I want to know when the app. It, when the view is unloading, I want to know when the controller is being deallocated, so that way the controller can clean up after itself, too. Um, and again, forward referencing, <laughs> we'll talk about it. So back to models again, now that we've talked about controllers just a little bit. Um, SQLite is baked right into iOS, which is kind of handy. You can write SQL if you really, really want to. 
um, I would advise against it. Instead, use, um, this might look kind of ugly, you use something called core data that's really not quite as bad as it looks. This is, as you might imagine, a data model. And it's really pretty easy to generate this inside of iOS. And when you do that, it basically is going to set up your database for you. It's going to generate some code for you. And then it's going to do a whole bunch of really handy things for you at runtime. So that way, you can have code that, while this is lengthy, I'm about to walk you through it, will essentially perform somewhat like active record in C. Now, as an old C hand, to me, this was the coolest thing since sliced bread. I got so excited when I first realized I could do this. You don't have to write a lick of SQL. This is essentially an ORM in C. So just to walk through kind of briefly, you're setting up a, this is setting up a request to get, um, to, okay, a little background on this. I wrote an application which provides a pivotal, tra a pivotal tracker front end for the iPad. So I have all kinds of data in, in my database, among other things, I have stories in the icebox. So I want to query for stories in the icebox in ascending order. And all this is just to do that. So yeah, it's a bit of code. But you set up a request, and then you tell the request, well, this is the kind of entity I'm going to request on. This little thing here is odd, this managed object context. It's sort of a combination of your database connection and also a factory for creating objects that are going to get stored in your database. Um, and that, that's one of those things that gets set up for you when you generate your scaffolding. So you don't have to worry about it too much. You just have to remember that you're going to need it in various places. So you're going to want to give yourself access to it. Um, I won't claim to be an expert on core data, and yet I was able to get an awful, awful lot done with it. So moving right along, so we've said we've got the request, we've said what we want to query for, and this is the sort order that we want to query it for, and so we have a sort descriptor. We say I want to query by a sort order field, which I have in the database in ascending order, and then you have to stick it into an array and then put it on the request. Then the predicate is a lot like your conditions in an active record finder. This is what I want to query on. And I put this particular sample in here because this is doing a join, and it's that easy. I'm saying I want to make sure, I want to get stories where the, where the project for the story has an ID and tracker of whatever. So that way, I'm only getting icebox stories for my project and not for other projects. Then I actually execute the query. I get, um, this is where we get into the more C stuff where I'm passing a double pointer, or I'm, I'm pat, yeah, I'm passing a double pointer so that way I can get an error back from um, the manage object context. Um, that's where we get a little bit, a little bit hot and heavy on the C side. If any, not C side, um, that comes next. Uh, where we get a little hot and heavy on the C side, and, and I can talk to you guys about that uh, after the presentation. If anyone has a question, because there are a, a few Cisms, but not too many in here. And then we just clean up after ourselves. I will talk about memory management later. It's not that bad, people. Okay. Come on. Camelot, Camelot, it's only a model. So anyway, we're gonna talk about views. We have this nice, lovely view here at Camelot. So this is Interface Builder, which is evil. Don't, you don't wanna use it. Interface Builder is, it goes hand in hand with Xcode. It is a tool, it's a, essentially a rapid application development tool for making a front end. And it sounds like such a great idea in principle. It is a piece of garbage. Um, and if you use Interface Builder with Xcode, as I'll show you later, you're going to have so many windows on screen, it's going to be really hard to get anything done. That's problem number one. Problem number two, you see this panel right here. These are all the properties for this little cell right here. And that's not for all the little widgets inside of it. It's just for the cell template. All these stupid little properties right there. And you can manage all of that from inside your code. Trying to manage that from a, a development tool just feels unwieldy, never mind. I have an easier time finding this information in the documentation. Again, I'll show you a little bit of the documentation than I can ever in this tool. So I strongly advise, if you, if you are interested in iOS, write the UI code by hand. Don't use Interface Builder. It seems like a good idea at first, very quickly just becomes an enormous pain in the butt. It's not worth it. Now, on the other hand, here, this is a good place to do uh, control, oops, I, I thought it was control, alt, 
and control option command eight to invert. And that's not working. Maybe I need to bust out of Keynote for a second. Yeah. Okay, so all of that code here, which by the way, I'll admit, this is Evan's, Evan's, one of Evan's principles of writing software is write it ugly first. This is ugly. <laughs> I haven't refactored this yet, but it gets the job done. Um, sorry, was there a question? Say yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. And all of that code just generates this UI right here. It gener it's actually generating a template and shoving data into it, if you will. Yes, I could refactor it, but we'll talk more about why I haven't done that yet in a bit. But all that code generates this, but this code is really, if you, can, you can tell by looking at the structure. That's one of the reasons I zoomed it way out. You can see that there's repetition just by looking at the structure. And if there's repetition, that can be factored. That can be factored into smaller bits of code. It could definitely be made better. But um, you can do some pretty nifty things without using interface builders. You just don't. So let's talk about some things in um, iOS and iOS development that scare people. This is usually number one. If, um, it, yeah, if you've been doing a lot of Ruby, if you've done a lot of dynamic languages, you don't have to deal with memory allocation. So people freak out when they think, oh my god, I have to free things on the heap and allocate things on the heap. Not really. You, you saw in the code sample I showed you earlier, or so in the code, code samples I showed you earlier. And let me actually go back, here we go. Um, for the request, I call alloc. Alec just says, go allocate the memory for it. And then I call init. And init is, uh, init is like the other half. The, these together are kind of like new in Ruby. So alloc allocates memory and init says, okay, go set up the object. Go you know, nil out things, set things to zero, whatnot. Or you can write your own custom initializer, which is really very, very easy to do. So I've allocated some memory. So if I've allocated some memory, what do you think I have to do later? I gotta clean up. So I got my request here. I rec release it here. That's not actually even freeing up the memory. You've got these things called reference counts on objects. I'm just, so when I release, I'm decrementing a reference count. When that reference count gets to zero, then iOS says, oh, I can free this now. So to those of you who've done Java, that might sound a little bit familiar. It's not garbage collected, not in iOS, but it's a similar principle. So, that's, you don't really need to be that afraid of memory allocation. Also, uh, you, you, just, you just need to be aware of when you're responsible for releasing and when you're not. If, the, if iOS gives you an object back, it's not your problem. iOS takes care of it. If you alloc something, then you own it. That's it. That's really not very scary, I don't think. And you guys probably don't want to hear the Camelot bit again, so let me skip ahead or skip back ahead go back to the future. Uh, no, no, no. There we go. Okay, so that's memory management. Static typing. Oh, question. Are there any tools for uh, finding... Uh... Memory leaks? Yes. Okay, glad you asked. Um, this is actually one of the places where Xcode is not evil. Um, Xcode's kind of tricky to use, admittedly, but... Uh, it does have some analysis tools built in. So when you, you can say build and analyze, and then when you do, it has these nice little blue highlights every place it thinks you might be leaking memory. Now, it's not a canonical list. I found that it can miss some pretty obvious things. I mean, I can have an alloc in a, in a method, and at the end of the method, I'm not releasing, and it just doesn't see it. There are other places where it finds some kind of clever ones. So. It's worth using, even if, it, if, even if it doesn't give you all of the answers. But it's definitely worth using. The other, one of the other nice things, at least just in terms of iOS, is if you really screw up memory, you're just going to screw up your own app. You're not going to screw up the device. Your, your app will eventually run out of memory and just crash and restart. And then, well, you, you're starting from a clean slate again. So that, that's pretty much the worst case. So it's not something necessarily to freak out about unless you're going to have a really leaky app and you're selling it and people are going to yell at you for your app crashing. But you know, that's about as bad as it gets. So static typing. Um, this is you know, one of the classic reasons I suppose Rubyists really hate Java. One of many reasons I could do a whole presentation on that, so I'll just stop there. But um, static typing in, in Objective-C is somewhat optional. 
there's a type called ID. You could pass almost everything around as an ID, and it's essentially um, an object, and you can call whatever you want on it. So it's, it's duct typed. You won't get compile time warnings on it. At the same time, static typing, the reason it exists in the first place is to help catch you making stupid mistakes. So as a newbie in Objective-C, it can be handy. It, it's been a little helpful for me. Occasionally when I get warnings, I look at the warning. Is this really something I care about? No, usually it's not. Usually I've just, I created a subclass and I was lazy and I passed it as a reference to the parent class and it says, you're trying to call a method on something you can't see. I know it's there, shut up, leave me alone. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, interface builder plus Xcode equals lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of windows. Um, Xcode 4, which comes out kind of soon, I'm not trying to advertise for Apple here, but uh, the Xcode 4, which is in preview right now, is just one window with Interface Builder built in if you really feel like you have to use it. Um, so that way you don't end up murdered by windows, because you can just have, Xcode loves to open up more and more windows for source code, and then Interface Builder adds even more, and you just have a hard time figuring out where it is you should be at any given time. Uh, another stupid little problem is if, you're act if you have a master window for, the, for Xcode, which is right here on the right, if you close that window, Xcode closes entirely. So if you have a bunch of source windows open and you accidentally close the master window in Xcode, well, Xcode just closes, and that sucks. Because when you get a bunch of windows, you just want to, at least I just want to annihilate them and get back to one. Sometimes I close Xcode doing it. Um, testing. I, I think that slide kind of speaks for itself. One of the hardest parts of being a, a, a Diet in the wool TDD adherent is that testing an iOS, unit testing even, and uh, integration testing, especially in iOS, suck. Um, there, I, I've, it, it is getting a little bit better. I found that there's a framework out there called GHUnit. I, I have a, a slide which actually cites it a little bit later, I think. Um, oh, that really is kind of dark, isn't it? Yeah, sorry. But I guess inverting it's probably not going to help very much. No, not really. It's like an uh, yeah, like an X-ray of. Uh... Okay, so we'll find that's another scene from the Holy Grail where the there's uh, the guy picking up the dead people. Bring out your dead, and then dead yes, I'm not dead yet. I'm getting I'm getting better. But uh, in any event. <laughs> In any event, um, testing is getting better in, I in iOS. iOS 4 actually has something a little bit like Cucumber, um, but you need to write your own adapter between the Cucumber-like language and your app, and that itself is a kind of hairy amount of Objective-C. I'm hoping that this will improve, but right now it's pretty awful. The unit testing, unit testing is getting a little bit better, but the a lot of the complexity in Objective-C is in the view. And so you really want integration tests and they're just not quite baked yet. So testing in iOS really means you write your code, you build your app, you launch the simulator, you go push buttons in the simulator, and you, you're trying to attenuate the lighting. You, um, you launch the simulator, you punch buttons in the simulator, and things work or they don't, and then rinse and repeat. Kind of sucks, so, but there's a, some other things you can do about that. So everyone needs a little bit of help getting started. As, as I said, this talk is really a, bit about, a little bit about introducing you to iOS, but also about giving you some of the tips I learned along the way. So first, get, if you're interested, get Mike Clark's um, Becoming Productive in Xcode videos, even though they will become obsolete kind of soon when Xcode, Xcode 4 comes out. Hugely useful, saved me a lot of effort once I actually knew how to use the editor, because Xcode is, or the IDE, Xcode is a very complicated IDE, and just getting some of the most basic features down, like being able to navigate files without having to point and click inside of Windows is, is huge. Then the, the, the documentation, as I said, is really pretty good. Um, you want to get to know UI view. UI view is your friend. He is the most important part in the user interface, if, unless you're writing some really hairy low-level stuff or writing games or something like that. If you're writing any kind of, of typical data form-driven application, you want to get to know UI view. The documentation is pretty darn verbose. You can see by the scroll bar over here. Um, you read through that, and you're going to be in pretty good shape. Then there's Stack Overflow. 
Uh, I found after doing a lot of Googling whenever I encountered some weird problems that almost every pro weird problem I encountered, someone else already encountered before. And usually that answer was on Stack Overflow. It's not even really worth going to Google unless you want to Google site colon stackoverflow.com. Put in your question, you'll find an answer. Again, save me lots of time. Now, uh, here are some libraries that you're probably going to want to consider using if you're going to write for iOS. Uh, touch XML and Touch JSON are probably exactly what you'd expect them to be. They're um, libraries for parsing and generating XML and JSON on iOS. So if you want to talk to any web services, that's going to be half of the equation. The other half is going to be ASI HTTP request, which is a very nice library for sending out um, HTTP requests. And it, it does async and synchronous. Um, and async is actually, I sort of showed you an example at the very beginning. You provide callbacks. It's beautiful. Um, it's probably easier to use than HTTP when you get right down to it. And then, uh, sorry, that's actual one reference to Ruby in the whole presentation other than my, uh, my last slide. Um, and then Facebook 320 is a whole bunch of widgets that uh, Facebook has open sourced that they used in their iPhone app. And I have not used them, but I perused them. And they're pretty kick-ass. So if, if you are serious about writing an iPhone app, you should probably, if you find that the standard widgets in the uh, iOS library aren't quite enough for you, in the UIKit library, I mean, sorry, UIKit is what they call the whole platform really for developing for iOS. Um, if the UIKit widgets aren't good enough for you, check out Facebook 320, save yourself some effort. You don't have to reinvent the wheel necessarily. And just a, a little bit of advice for some big gotchas um, or little gotchas or little things I think might help. Um, always remember to lead your, your strings with an at. If you don't, your, your app will crash in the simulator, you'll look at the console, and you'll have no idea what happened. And you'll sit there and you'll kick yourself 10 minutes, 20 minutes later when you realize, I forgot an app in the string. Because it, it won't tell you, it, the app will just die. Do read about UI view. I already said it earlier, I'll say it again. Do read about UI view. It'll save you a lot of trouble. Um, do not use interface builder. Last one I hadn't mentioned yet, NS log which is not any different really than doing an active record based logger dot whatever or console dot debug in JavaScript. It is really your friend. Compile times in iOS are really pretty short. Um, playing around in the simulator is nice, but being able to see the states of your models by just dumping them out to the console is beautiful. So that, that way you don't actually have to futz around with the debugger in iOS, uh, you don't really want to use Xcode's debugger for, for iOS, it's kind of awful. Use NSLog, it's easy. That's where you're gonna run into the problem with strings again, because with NSLog, you're gonna be passing in strings. Um, remember the at sign. And, okay, so finally, me, I'm Evan Light. Um, my company, I'm a freelancer. I don't know if you guys can even read that. Can you read that? Okay. Um, I have my, my Twitter, GitHub, Xbox Live Gamer Tag, because, well, I'm a computer gamer too. Uh, I'm contracting to a company in San Francisco called CoTweet. They are looking for hire, so I figured I'd, I'd help them out and just mention here if anyone's looking for Ruby work. Um, they prefer people in San Francisco, but they're open to telecommuters too, so if you're interested, come see me. Any questions? Okay, where to start? Uh, um, so I forgot to mention it, thank you. Right. Okay, so, um, it's Nick, right? Yeah. Okay, what Nick uh, was asking about was, um, the night before last, Apple, right, right before I'm gonna give my presentation telling you all about Objective-C and iOS, Apple says, well, now we're going to change our minds and say you don't just have to use Objective-C, you really can use whatever you want on iOS, the condition being that you can, you're not allowed to download code at runtime which clearly that, I'm guessing that that particular stipulation doesn't apply to JavaScript. But other than that, and you know, JavaScript and HTML because web apps do a lot of that. But other than that, that would mean that if you can get Ruby running, for example, in uh, iOS reliably, then as long as all the Ruby code for your app is in your app and that Ruby code can interact with iOS via UIKit or some other mechanism, then you could write almost all of your app in Ruby just so long as you use just enough Objective-C to bootstrap a Ruby interpreter. So, someone go out and do that. <laughs> it might be incredibly slow at first, but uh, it'd be nice to have the option. Or, more than likely, someone will come along and put Java on there too, and then Oracle will sue them. Um, 
So there's that. The other one, um, the other related announcement was that they also put out the App Store review guidelines, and I haven't looked at those yet because I only have one app up there, and they already approved it. Um, other questions? I, there was a hand here. No? Well, he, he Same question? Okay. Oh, Lee. Uh, the at sign in front of strings is just a shortcut for effectively creating an S string object, right? So what you're doing when you leave it off is creating a, a bare C string instead of having the method. You're creating a bare C string, and it's trying to assign it to what's going to be, I believe, an NS string pointer. And it says, that you're, you're, base, you're trying to take a character array and put it in a string, and it says, well, I don't know what that is. You know, that, 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 that's not going to be compatible. Um, under the hood, and some of this is supposition, but from my background in C, a lot of, well, first off, I didn't say Objective-C, for those of you who know C, Objective-C is a superset of C. So ordinary C is perfectly valid in Objective-C. Um, Objective C is um, came out of Next, which was around in, which started in the late '80s. So, it's got a long and storied history. The API uh, UI kit is based on Coco, which is based on Next Step. Again, long and storied history. It's fairly mature. It's been around for more than 20 years. Um, having been a Java developer uh, for entirely too long before getting into Ruby, I can tell you Coco is. Once you get past a little bit of the weird names, everything starts with NS for next step. Once you get past some of the weird things like that, it's infinitely better than the J2 SDK. It's so much easier to use. Um, and about the at sign and other things like it, I'm pretty sure most of those are really preprocessor instructions. That there's a lot of macro, there, that a lot of Objective-C is really using macros. Um, I, I guess I, I, I kind of glossed over it, but you probably saw, so I'm gonna jump back very briefly to my second slide. Second slide, there we go. Um, the square, square brackets here, um, you don't use the dot notation in Objective-C to, to send a message. You use the square bracket notation that says, this is the receiver of the message and this is the message that's being sent. And yes, it can get a little squirrely because you start nesting your square brackets. Get over it. You guys are using Ruby. You, you probably like Lisp. Lisp is insane with parentheses. Again, get over it. It's, it's really not that bad. It's one of those language syntax things, again, like the at sign in Ruby and the double at sign and whatnot, that you will learn to see past after you do it, just a little bit of it. Yes? Well, the original objective C by Brad Cox uh, depended in was implemented almost entirely in the, uh, in the uh, secret processor. That makes a lot of sense from what I've seen. Because I won't claim to be yeah, an expert, well, but that makes a lot of sense. I'm wondering. Everyone hear that? That the original objective C was basically implemented entirely in the C preprocessor. And well, what I'm wondering is, is uh, when you use this incarnation of it, uh, how much of this stuff is kind of built into their compiler and how much is I think a fair amount in the compiler because the editor is able to warn you about a lot of stupid things that, that you do as you do them. Um, I, unless I'm very uh, um, unattentive, which is possible because like most programmers, I must have some degree of ADD. Um, I, it, I don't believe uh, Xcode warns me about the forgetting my at sign in front of a string because, well, also because it's perfectly legal in C to do that, and again, superset of C. But it should be smart enough to realize you're probably using an NS string. You probably mean to have an at sign there, dummy. But it doesn't tell me that. I guess what I'm wondering is, is there, is there a separate preprocessor uh, phase? Uh, um, I, can't yeah. I can't say that. Um, I can't say that. Files. I can't say, oh, there are, there are headers, yes. Um, so there is that much. There's at least that much preprocessing going on. There's got to be, there's at least as much preprocessing going on as there is in C. Again, because. It is a superset, again, because oh, I, can, I can say with certainty, because I use some very basic C macros in my code just for constants, because you don't really have the notion of a constant in C, I think, unless they changed that in the language spec in the late 80s, because I've been away for a bit. Well, not that long. Paul, you had a question? It's Mac. <laughs> that's that's when another way sure. another way that Apple makes their money. Luigi. Um, the the screen you had with a huge amount of code 
<laughs> yes. Yes. Would that be possible to to build an interface for it, or did you have to write all that code? I contemplated before whether it would be possible to do it, and then I wrote it, and then I rethought it later. I, obviously, I did a lot of learning as I went. Um, some portion of it, certainly. The, here, I'll, I'll go back to that slide if I can find it. There we go. So the, the labels, for example, are very predictable. So those could have been in an interface builder, uh, XML interface builder file. Um, and then I could have populated the data, well, and actually each of, each of these widgets, except for the Sparkline, um, are just uh, UI labels is what they're called. So I could have put in placeholder labels that I would then populate later. The Sparkline, though, is entirely programmatically generated. That's a library. I didn't mention it because that's just kind of a little thing. It's called CK Sparkline. I tweaked it slightly. Yeah, I can be so proud of myself. I tweaked it slightly to make a little red dot at the end just to, to highlight the end of the Sparkline, put a little more attention there. Uh, but. Um, yeah, I could have done some of it in, in Interface Builder instead of writing the code. But with writing the code, the reason to do that is because, well, a reason to do it is because I'm a control freak. So I, I, can, I can admit my problems. And so at least I know exactly how things are going to be positioned because, and I guess it bears mentioning, if you are writing, if you are writing your own view from scratch, you have to position absolutely everything yourself. So a lot of the code here, you can barely make these little bits out here. The yellow bits here are numbers, um, which are, oh my god, hard-coded in there right now, which is evil. But um, a lot of that is positioning. And then the reason I wanted to register to know when the view rotates is because when there's a view rotation, I have to reposition widgets based on the view orientation. So fair question. Yes, Fernando. GitHub, actually. There's a, there really is a fair amount of Objective-C stuff on GitHub. Um, I found CK Sparkline was on GitHub. I found it using Google. Facebook 320, also on GitHub. There are a fair number of projects out there. Uh, I guess I didn't have it in a slide. I only just played with it last yesterday morning. It's called GH Unit. And it's not a bad framework for doing unit testing on Objective-C. I need to play with it some more, but it's not too hard to set up, and it runs right in the simulator. So it, again, not integration testing, but it's a start. Um, and I guess that brings me to one other last point. Again, if, with what I mentioned, the uh, thin controllers, fat, uh, fat models, you have to, you actually do, it does take effort to push the code down on the model. Um, Apple really does try to, to herd you into putting more logic into the controller. So when you're using, Core data, which was that active record-like mechanism I told you about, that code gets generated into the controller. That's why the controllers are 500 lines of scaffolding. You have to copy-paste that code out and put it where you want it, if you, in the model specifically, if that's what you really want. Otherwise, you're going to end up with multi-thousand line controllers that are entirely unwieldy. Um, I, I put them in the models. I was much happier. I had a lot more files, but many smaller files. Um, another question. Nikki. Oh, sorry. But would you say that Objective-C is worth learning kind of in light of, you know, the platform being less restrictive and now you might be able to use something like uh, Mono Develop or Mono Touch or whatever it's called, uh, or Flash if they get that or something like that? I think Objective-C is worth learning for a few reasons, um, but there's a little bit of historical bias there for me. I think C is a beautiful language. It was the first language I ever learned. But of all the languages I know, Ruby's my favorite, C is my next favorite, still. If I need to write something that's going to go really, really, really fast, I write it in C. Uh, it's a system level language. Objective-C is a weird combination of, of because of Cocoa, because of UIKit, it's a weird combination of an application level language or a system level language with a good application library that, that can read literately um, with a system level language. But if you know C, 
then you can learn almost any other language except maybe Lisp. <laughs> Um, and so I think Objective-C is great to learn for that. Also, I think Objective-C is great to learn because, as I said, um, having named arguments really encourages you to write literate, beautiful code. And it, it might, when you, if you, when you come back to Ruby, if you go back and forth a bit, you might find yourself writing a lot of methods that accept hashes and doing the same thing. But personally, I think that's a pretty awesome thing to do. That's how I like to write code. Uh, beyond that, uh, Objective-C is native on iOS. So if you want fast, you're writing Objective-C. If you're just, if you're, if you're okay with loading up web pages, running in a browser essentially, not in the browser, but in what they call, I think, a UI web view, um, then, eh, you know, you could use PhoneGap, for example. That's another, there's PhoneGap, there's Rhodes if you want to write Ruby that runs on Android and iOS. There are all kinds of other, uh, essentially, cross-platform develop, cross development um, environments. Uh, some of them generate Objective C, but I think it, I think it'd be, it's good to dabble in a little. This is a hobby for me. I did this for fun. Um, I still play with Objective C. I'm still working on my application because people are telling me it doesn't have enough features, um, and I'm probably going to open source it. I hadn't decided on that firmly before. Uh, it does not have a test suite at all yet, so that's one of the things that's been holding me back. But um, I'm going to start writing some unit tests for it, and then I'll probably open source it. And if anyone else wants to help make a really cool Pivotal Tracker client an iPad, I'd be glad to take some contributions. Any other questions? I understand I'm running low on time. Okay, thank you. <laughs>